All right, welcome back to another episode of the Contract to Close series. And I'm, I'm really excited here today because I have a close friend and colleague that I've worked with on, and I did the math, 48 deals together, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 48 deals that Josh and I have worked on together. Um, and so I'm gonna first introduce Josh and then we're gonna go in on a subject. We're gonna go deep on a subject. We'll try to keep it entertaining. We're gonna talk about everything about title insurance. We're gonna start off about you know what is title, why get title insurance, what it is, and we'll try to keep it entertaining and um, provide some stories along the way. So a little background on Josh. Josh Rowling is a senior counsel and real estate lawyer with Foley and Lardner. Uh, Josh represents real estate developers, investors, owners, and tenants in all aspects of commercial real estate transactions, including acquisitions and sales, development, leasing, new market tax credit financing, tax increment financing, private placement, and zoning. He also counsels clients in connection with the real estate aspects of corporate mergers and acquisitions and has significant experience in, mul in mul multi-state real estate portfolio transactions. Josh, anything you'd like to, to add to that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a mouthful. Um, but yeah, no, happy to be here. And you know, I, I'd say my my bread and butter is kind of what we're talking about today, which is kind of the acquisition process and you know all the the various pieces that go into it. So I think this will be, uh, you know, we'll do our best to keep it interesting, but it's it's useful. <laughs> it's useful if not yeah. if not always interesting. This is like the nuts and bolts, the real foundational stuff that you need to know. You need to get this information into your into your toolkit so that you can you can go forward. And there's no better expert, you know. Obviously, Josh and I have a long track record together, so um, there's really, in my opinion, no one better to be talking about this and all other stuff related to due diligence and closing on real estate. Josh knows um, a tremendous amount here, so we're really fortunate to have him. So why don't we kick this off? Why don't we back up to the whole process around title? Right, we're getting right down to the basics here. So, Josh, why don't you give us a, a primer? What is what is title? What what is it? Yeah, so so title insurance, you know, I mean, it's an insurance policy at its base. Um, you know, that's kind of a, a piece that people sometimes forget about, frankly. And we can talk a little bit about why that is. But at the end of the day, um, it's a it's an insurance policy you get from a title insurance company. Um, so it has to be a big you know, well-capitalized company, and they're ensuring that you own a piece of property um, and that title to that property is subject only to a enumerated list of exceptions. So, mm -hmm. you know, as, as you know, Michael, you know, property in, in the U.S. Um, is a little bit unique in that, you know, you record deeds with a register of deeds in a county Mm -hmm. And if you grant an easement or put a, a declaration or, you know, any kind of restriction in place, that all gets added to the, the county records. So, so the title company, you know, essentially does, they go not in person anymore, but um, electronically or, you know, somehow they search the county land records, just like they, you know, been doing for hundreds of years and, and come up with this list. And so, you know, the, the insurance piece is really after you buy that title insurance policy, if mm. if someone comes out of the woodwork and says, hey, you know, I have a mortgage on this property or I own this property, um, you just call up your title company and say, I'm making a title insurance claim um, and they have to indemnify you, which means they have to defend it and you know if they lose and that person actually does own the property and you don't they have to pay you um, up to kind of the amount of of insurance so you know that's the insurance piece yeah um from a transaction perspective i would say you know what we focus on title insurance is more the diligence perspective which right. is that list of exceptions you know really tells you what's what affects that property. And so some of those things may be innocuous. I mean, you know, it's utility easements, you know, there's electrical easements running along the street or, you know, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's pretty typical. It's not going to affect your use of the property or the purchase price. Um, but, you know, oftentimes 
you run into a, a declaration that restricts the type of uses or requires approval for building plans, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. so that's where, you know, even before you buy, you essentially buy the title insurance policy by paying a premium when you close on the property. But before you get to closing, you know, the kind of the, the piece that you're talking about in this series is the diligence piece where you use right. that, that kind of title insurance commitment um, for, for diligence purposes to kind of understand what you're working with. Yeah. So why don't we um, why don't we take a step back and we'll talk about, you know, how the process works. We have some stories. I know Josh and I have some stories of our own. Uh, going through and finding out why the process of running due diligence on title is so important and and why you could you could discover things before you buy it that will actually prevent you from buying it. So if we step back, you know, the first time you put a property under contract, you, you have a due diligence period. It's usually a certain amount of time. Typically, you'll you'll deposit some earnest money that will be refundable up until the due diligence period ends, right? And so during that time, there's a lot of things that happen. One of which is doing what Josh had talked about, is doing due diligence on title, making sure there's no clouds or anything that might inhibit your ownership to that property. So, you know, as a first step, you engage with the title company. And I'll, I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Josh, because there's a process here that happens, right? Like they'll, they'll first give you some documents, there'll be a review. And there's a critical piece that, you know, from our perspective, you know, I would always use a lawyer uh, to go through this process. And we lean heavily. Uh, I've leaned heavily on Josh a lot through this phase and his whole team. So why don't we, we kick it back to you, go through the process, and maybe we can splice in some some interesting discoveries along the way. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. 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 Um, so like you said, the, the process really kicks off, you know, right when you sign a purchase agreement, you don't want to waste any time getting a title insurance commitment ordered. So the, the first step is really engage your title company. Um, and, you know, we can talk a little bit about picking a title company, but. Yeah. How do you like, what's the, how do you like, what is, what is that? Yeah. Process? Why do you choose one? Is there a reason to choose one or the other? Are they commodities title companies? Like how, how do we, how do you look at them from, uh, from that yeah. perspective when you're selecting? Yeah, it's it's an interesting business. I mean, it's it's very localized in that, as you said before, you know, ultimately what they're doing is searching a county's land records. So, you know, if you have a property in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, where I am, ultimately someone in Milwaukee or close by, you know, someone probably in Wisconsin is going to do that title search. So, you know, one thing you could do is just try to find a local title company wherever you're buying property. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's, you know, if you're in Pennsylvania, you know, you might not know <laughs> what's a good title company to use. So, yeah. so there's, there's a number, you know, probably now just two or three um, big national title companies where, you know, you can kind of work with one person, you know, it's a relationship business in that regard where you know you, there's a salesperson who's very dynamic um they might not know the first thing about title but you know you got your salesperson that kind of helps the process flow along yeah and then you know they you kind of have one person that serves as a point of contact and then they do the work of finding the milwaukee county title search you know whoever needs to do yeah. the local search so you know that if you're if you're real active in the real estate market and you know you're not just doing a one-off acquisition or a one-off sale um you know that's probably the way to go just because the longer you can kind of work with one title company um you know the more you kind of build some trust you know yeah. they'll try to make things work for you um and so that's a, a kind of a, an aside on picking title companies yeah, we have this ongoing thing. We, we've talked about this in, in our, um, our our Series 3 that we're launching soon, which is a whole collection of, of um, podcasts that we did. Um, it's a running theme of just like network and connectivity. And yeah. even with your title company, if you're out there and you're pretty prolific in the space, it's great to have just like a go-to title company. They know you, you know them, and they help 
movement in some of these counties it's difficult it takes a long time and yeah. sometimes if you're if you're there and you're with these title companies they can help move mountains for you and we, we've seen it josh and i've both seen it happen um so yeah it's a good good thing to have it's a good group to have some continuity with um yeah all right great all yeah. right so, oh go ahead sorry oh i was just gonna say the the reason that those salespeople at title companies really like repeat business and you know serving as your point of contact is they get the lion's share of the title premium. Hmm. So there's there's a financial you know reason that they want to keep you happy. You know, they they pay a little bit to their local searcher that does kind of the work. Hmm. Um, but they typically get a, a pretty big portion. And so, you know, again, that's why having that relationship is beneficial for them. But it, it's also good for you to, you know, have someone that wants to keep you happy because like you say, they can they can kind of pressure someone in a remote county that would otherwise just say, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to put this to the back burner. I don't care, you know, right. if, if we turn it around in a week or two weeks or three weeks. Um, so anyway, um, you know, you have your title company. You want you essentially just need to send them, you know, a, as much information as you can about the property. So you know, typically you send them the address if you mm -hmm. have. If you have kind of a legal description or a tax key pin number or anything like that um you know you'll send it to them and then you know they kind of take it from there um, so you engage with them and then you try to get them this information as soon as possible because time is of the essence still like right now you you have a clock ticking and right. so there there are certain things you need to get them Previ previous title commitments always helpful um Okay, so you get all that stuff, and then they take it, and then what's what's the first thing they do? Are there deliverables they give to you? How does that how does that whole thing work? Yeah, so you know they'll they'll take what you give them, do their search, you know the county records, like we said before, and then what they kick out of that is is called a title insurance commitment, and so it's called that because it's really they're committing to issue you a title policy, and so you know, again nobody as you get into this process, nobody thinks of the commitment really as something that you would bind the title company with, but that's what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, they, the title company is going to be careful. They want to make sure they pick up everything they possibly can because they're committed to issue you a policy, you know, based on that commitment. And so, yeah. so that's, you know, they, they have to stand behind it. Um, I, I've never been part of an adversarial, you know, where you actually show them the commitment and say, you, you have to issue a policy. Um, but that's that's why it's called that, at least. Um, so they send you this commitment, um, as well as copies of all the underlying documents that are referenced in that commitment. And what types of underlying documents is these are things they find when they're searching, right? And they're, they're looking yeah. for. And this is where it gets in. So usually this is where, Josh, you guys dive in and why don't you uh this is where you find all these interesting little nuggets uh, that come out so you know, it's very rare in the um in the due diligence process for title to be the reason that a project dies or gets kicked out but it does happen um and so josh i know you had some stories um and maybe maybe you give us some examples of things you might you might have found when the title company comes back with their commitment and you have to read through it and there's a process there, but maybe, maybe you give a little, uh, <laughs> anecdotal stories of things that have come. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I have seen a couple, um, you know, it's, it's stuff like a lien for unpaid assessments for, you know, a declaration. So, you know, you have kind of a shopping center and that all the parcels are owned by different people and everybody has to pay, you know, one central party to maintain or yeah. clean roads or something. And so, you know, if, if you just don't do that, then yeah. it's rare, but they'll file a lien against your property. And so, you know, we had one deal where there was a lien filed and, you know, that triggered to us, uh, you know, to ask a question to the seller and say, you know, what is going on here? And yeah, I mean, it turns out that they were just not paying, you know, the tenant was not, not only not paying <laughs> their assessments, but I, I think they weren't paying rent or, you know, so it, it was kind of a red flag that, that 
triggered, that triggered you know, yeah. more, uh, more fulsome review of, you know, who we're dealing with and, you know, some concerns about the deal. But yeah, uh, cool. Yeah. So there, there's a couple others, but why, so, um, the commitment that you get back, it's organized, right? It's always the same. There's, there's like, it's templatized, right? You're not going to get a different formatted commitment from one title company to the next. It's all, it's all uniform. They follow the protocol, right? Is there, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah, for the, for the most part, that's true. Um, it's a little bit state specific too. So mm -hmm. like Texas has a, a very particular form that's somewhat unusual. Um, but in general, you know, you kind of see the same, the same sections and kind of the same stuff reflected. Somewhere. Yeah. So typically high, is it like high level? What, what, how does that, how do they, like, what, did, what do you usually see? Like, how do they, how do they flow? Yeah. So, so typically you have, um, it's broken into schedules is the term they use, but so schedule a typically is, will tell you who the current owner is, which, mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, you know, as silly as it sounds, I mean, that's the first thing you want to look at because there's been times where, you know, we've gotten a commitment and the party that they say is the owner is not your seller. <laughs> and, you know, that's another <laughs> where you go, wow, you know, we better uh, better look into this a little bit more. But, you know, and sometimes it's just they change their name or they were acquired or, yeah. you know, there's so, there's an explanation for it. But, you know, again, you you don't want to get to closing and, you know, not be able to get a deed or, you know, you want to get, run that stuff to ground. Right. Um, so schedule A will tell you who the current owner is. Um, and then really the legal description of the property. So kind of the, the description that, that you need to use in the deed and that's in the land records. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh there's usually a, a schedule. It's called schedule B one, which are requirements. So, you know, this plays into the it being a commitment. Um, there's a whole list of things that the title company says, you know, we'll issue you a title policy, but you need to satisfy all these things. And sometimes, you know, that could be three pages of stuff. And it includes, you know, getting organizational documents from the seller and, you know, the seller giving a deed, paying the purchase price, kind of basic stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes, Sometimes you'll see a requirement that the seller, you know, get a corrective deed from a prior owner to fix some historical issue. Um, you know, so it's, it's again, one of those things where, you know, you see these, if you start seeing these a lot, you can kind of say, okay, all the requirements, you know, yada, yada, they're all the same. Yeah. But every once in a while they throw in, you know, some surprise. Um, so you yeah. have to read, you know, you, you want to read through those. And at least make sure that there's nothing in there that, you know, is going to take a long time to resolve. Um, and yeah. then schedule what's called schedule B2. Those are the exceptions. So that's that's kind of your list of all the encumbrances that affect the property. And so that's that's where we spend, you know, from the legal perspective, that's where we spend our our time is going through that list and actually reading each of those documents to make sure that, you know, really there's nothing that affects the value of the property, um, you know, and kind of financial on that side. And then, sure. you know, there's nothing that affects kind of the operation of the property. And so, you know, those are kind of the two, the two big mindsets you have because, you know, it, it depends on your client, but, you know, sometimes you have people that say, look, I don't care. All I'm going to do is operate here. And, you know, I don't care what's on title. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have to say, look, if you go to sell this or if you go to finance this, you know, the buyer or the lender is going to care. So, you know, don't just ignore yeah, that, it. Ignore that's that. really an important point because you're buying it for yourself. And why you might not care if you're doing if you're underwriting this thing, you're valuing it a your reversion value just because you bought it because you didn't care the market or most people in the market are going to look at that and it's going to be it's going to inhibit their ability to pay what you thought you could pay the other piece like you said is getting a mortgage right like lenders are extremely risk averse if they see anything impacting the value or the marketability of the property then it's it's a major red flag it does it does show up um uh 
you know, there's there's one where we had um, what was it? It was uh, uh, I forget the location, but there was some there was like a gas a gas company that actually pretty much owned the company by the way it was written. Like they or owned the land by the way it was written. It was basically the owners of the land couldn't do anything without permission from from the large gas conglomerate even though and they did a bunch of stuff a bunch of environmental issues but really what came down we could i think you could get over the environmental what it came down to was really the title piece and that you really didn't you owned it but you kind of did you didn't own it in a way that was marketable so yeah yeah it's consent consent for doing anything to the property um mm -hmm. and yeah i mean that's you know you could easily kind of brush over that you know, if you don't read through these documents, you know, you just say, oh, it's kind of a, a restriction, but everyone, everyone's, you know, operating here and, you know, it's probably fine. But yeah, that one was, was a real, uh, a real problematic one. Um, yeah. You know, and, and we've seen uh, on other deals, but I, I represented a uh, apartment developer that was going to buy a vacant farm to build a apartment complex on. And and there was a deed restriction on the property in favor of the U.S. government that prohibited building anything over two feet tall. <laughs> two feet tall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you so, serious? <laughs> yeah. So it was it, during the Cold War that this property was between like a missile control site and a missile launch site. Oh, wild! And and they had to have a a clean line of sight between you know where the controls were and where the missiles were and uh so they put this restriction on that so no one could build anything that would block you know that line of sight <laughs> and we're so we read that we're just like wow you know this is uh this is unusual and you know it you know one of the things with title that's tricky is somebody puts this stuff on you know in the 50s or 60s and you know now to develop that parcel, you'd have to go and find someone who can sign on behalf of the United States government to release. You know this restriction is completely. Yeah. You know, they don't need it anymore. These missile sites are no longer there, thank goodness. Um, but you know that's the kind of thing where you just you know people can gum up title by putting stuff in place and then you know forgetting to clean it up. Yeah. Um, so you never know. Yeah, you never know what you're gonna find. Yeah. So, so this is like the meat and potatoes of like going through procuring title insurance, and the rest of it's pretty much boilerplate thereafter. Now, or am I missing something? Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I guess the one thing to point out, uh, this kind of goes to the timing piece, is you know, the the main reason that you want to get your title order right away is because you're likely going to get an, a survey of the property as well and the surveyor needs that title commitment in order to do their work or at least to finalize their work so you know it's kind of this first piece that other you know later other people rely on um mm -hmm. but yeah i mean so essentially once once you've reviewed you know you typically have some kind of comment you know you may say hey you know this exception is listed but it doesn't affect the property um, you know, title companies are risk averse, so they'll they'll list anything they can plausibly say affects the property. And so you'll get a survey and it'll say, you know, this doesn't affect, um, you know, so you'll have a little bit of back and forth with the title company. And then, you know, really, when you get close to closing, um, you'll ask them to prepare what's called a pro forma title policy. And so that that's kind of the last stage. Um, and so the pro forma, you know, is, is really, it, it just looks like a title policy instead of a commitment. Um, it's, it doesn't bind the title company or provide any coverage, but it's kind of your last way to, to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and everything looks correct. Um, but then, but then, yeah, when you close, you pay a one-time title premium. Um, which is state specific on you know what that costs, but mm -hmm. it's based on the amount of coverage you get, which is based on the purchase price. Um, and then the title company issues the title policy in the form that you've agreed on. And you know then as long as you own the property, if you own it 100 years or you own it six months, 
um, you know, you can make a title claim if if there's an issue. So yeah. I, I've actually never seen a title claim be made. <laughs> After that, you never look at that. You never see it again. Yeah. <laughs> you get to sell it, and you need to provide it. No, yeah. but, um, really, the crux is is you know it's a value piece, right? When you're in due diligence, you're looking at you know, like you said operations, and, and when you go to sell the property again, so really it does impact. Um, it's an, it's a critical piece. You have to do it, um, and it impacts the value of the building should you discover something. So, all right, well, Josh, this was great. You know, thank you so much for coming on. Anything else? Maybe something we missed? Um, anything else you want to add before we sign off here? Um, no, I mean, there's just so much more to talk about. So we'll have to <laughs> do it again sometime. But yeah, yeah. We can talk about uh, title endorsements as a whole separate thing. Oh, there you um, go. <laughs> you know, and, and your policies. So. We'll, yeah, have, I mean, we'll have a title series within within the contract to close series. So yeah, I mean yeah, we could we could definitely do that. Awesome. All right. Well, Josh, it's been fantastic. Um, and to everyone that's out there listening or watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you on the next one. All right. Thank you.